Yi Gwich, and welcome back to our fourth lecture uh, in our lecture series hosted by the Loyola Institute and Trinity College Library, Trinity College Dublin, to commemorate the 15th centenary uh, for the birth of St. Columba of Colum Kill uh, of Iona. My name is uh, Dr. Alexander. Uh, O'Hara. I'm very pleased to uh, welcome this evening uh, Dr. Con Casey and Dr. Fauncia Ryan, uh, both from the Loyola, Loyola Institute in Trinity. Uh, they will present uh, on Sushkela Moore Columkilla, the Great Gospel of Columkilla, the Book of Kells, Trinity College Dublin, MS 58 contains the four Gospels in Latin based on the Vulgate text, um, intermixed inter, uh, with readings from the earlier Old Latin translation. The date and place of origin of the Book of Kells have attracted a great deal of scholarly interest. So this lecture will give an introduction to the Book of Kells, the great Gospel book of Columkilla, discuss its provenance, composition, and iconography. Uh, and both our speakers this evening are uh, distinguished theologians who will uh, give a detailed theological reading of one or more of the beautifully illustrated pages uh, from the Book of Kells. Dr. Cornelius Casey uh, is the founding director of the Lyol Institute, Trinity College Dublin. He lectured in theology at Trinity from 2013 to this year, uh, specializing in the theology of Thomas Aquinas. He's also developed his teaching and research on the theology of the early Irish church, in particular, the Book of Kells, uh, offering a module uh, in this area at, at Trinity. His publications include an edited volume, The Church in Pluralist Society, Social and Political Roles, published by Notre Dame University Press in 2019. Dr. Fauncia uh, also a former uh, director of the Loyola Institute, lectures in theology uh, at, at Trinity College Dublin and is a fellow of Trinity College Dublin. She's president of the Irish Theological Association from 2010 to 2016 and is presently the section president of the Irish branch of the European Society for Catholic Theology. Dr. Ryan's current research focuses on the virtue of truth telling in the context of a so-called post-truth era. And she, can, she contributed to the aforementioned publication, The Church and Pluralist Society um, on consulting the faithful in matters of doctrine. Um, and her research interests have uh, expanded to include an interest in the theology of the early Irish church, in particular, uh, the Book of Kells. And with colleagues at Trinity, she developed a four week online course uh, called the Book of Kells, Exploring an Irish Medieval Masterpiece, which is available uh, through Future Learn uh, for free and is, is, is an excellent introduction uh, to, to the Book of Kells. Um, so, uh, Dr. Casey and Dr. Ryan, you're, you're, you're very welcome. Okay, so thank you, Alex. Um, I just want to share my screen for a moment. I should, I should say also that uh, the lecture will last about uh, 40 minutes. There'll be time for Q&A afterwards. And um, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, box and, and we'll be able to discuss uh, those after the lecture. Thank you. Okay, so thank you again, Alex. And the backdrop that you've seen behind Alex is that, that of the long room of the old library here at Trinity College Dublin. And it's in this library that the manuscript that we are studying tonight, the Book of Kells, TCD Manuscript 58, is on public display. 
Normally, about one million people visit the Book of Kells each year. Of course, this was before COVID. But it is now open again for visits and people are beginning to flock back. We've described it here as a work of iconography and as a book of theology. And both these understandings are intimately related. There will be three parts to tonight's presentation. Firstly, we'll give an overview of the manuscript, which dates from around 800. Secondly, there will be an introduction to the iconography. And thirdly, a reading, a theological reading of two of the fully illuminated, the fully illustrated pages. In the Annals of Ulster in 1007, we read a manuscript described as the most precious object of the Western world, Prevmind Irhur Dawan. Most scholars take this reference to be to the Book of Kells. The Book of Kells identified a thousand years ago as the most precious object of the Western world. Another title the Book of Kells was known by was Sushkel Moore Colum Kill, the great gospel book of Colum Kill. So let us go back a little. Christianity probably came to Ireland in the late fourth century. We have archaeological evidence of a church in Carlehillen in County Kerry on the Ivora Peninsula from this period. By 521, 522, Christianity was well established. And this was when the column kill of this great gospel was born. Known to the Latin speaking world as Columba, Column Kill Columba was born into the famous Emil family of Tyrconnell of Donegal. Around 561, with companions, Columbus sailed towards Scotland as a pilgrim for Christ. In 563, he settled on that little island of Iona, a small fertile island off Mull on the west coast of Scotland. And here he established a monastery. We learn details of his life from his biographer, Adamon, also an abbot on Iona. In the end of his life, we read that Columba was working on a copy of the Psalms, and many books associated with Columba were revered after his death. They became relics. So in a similar way, the book, the great gospel book of Columkill, was associated with Columba. The monastery that he founded at Iona thrived, and many more monasteries were founded from there. Iona grew to be the prosperous head of a confederation of monasteries. And these monasteries had wide influence over church affairs in Iona and in the north of England. Lindisfarne later became one of its most prominent foundations. Other foundations include Derry, Durrow, and of course, Kells, which is our concern here. So what is the Book of Kells? As Alex mentioned, the Book of Kells is an illustrated manuscript, principally of the four Gospels. It's generally agreed that it was composed on the island of Iona. And while we cannot be completely sure of a date, most scholars agree that it was around the year 800. It's also generally agreed that at least the initial phase of its composition was on the island of Iona. Some more work may have been done on it when it came to Kells. The peace at the monastery on the island of Iona ended with the Viking invasions, which began in the late 700s. It was probably these that meant that some monks left the island and traveled over to Kells. They brought the manuscripts that we now call the Book of Kells, Sir Skelmoor, Columkilla, with them. We know that there was peace in Kells at this time because there was sufficient peace to allow the building of a church in 814. So the Book of Kells, as we've said, principally a gloriously illuminated manuscript, reproducing the texts of the four gospels by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. However, it's also important to note that there are additional materials serving, if you like, as an introduction and a partial commentary on the gospels. The introductory materials include a concordance, this is a technique whereby authors link 
a passage in one gospel with the same passage in another gospel for easy reference. There's also a listing and a part explanation of Hebrew names and a brief summary of the gospel narratives known as the Brevis Causae. These folios are also wonderfully illuminated. The text of the gospel that is copied in the Book of Kells is largely that of St. Jerome's Vulgate. St. Jerome had compiled the Vulgate after a detailed study of Hebrew, Greek, and Latin texts, and he'd been asked by Pope Damascus to do this. So obviously, the monks on these islands had access to very early copies of the gospels. Now, if you look at the image that we have there, we have folio 27b. It's an introduction to the Gospel of Matthew. And you'll see there are four different images in four different boxes. We have here the four symbols for the four Gospels. These symbols came to be associated with each of the Gospels. We have the man for Matthew. We have the lion for Mark, the eagle for John, and then the calf for Luke. Sometimes it can be difficult to tell the difference between the lion and the calf, and the best place to look is at the legs. The calf will have hooves, while the lion will have his claws. So that's the four Gospels, folio 27b. Here's another introduction. The four Gospels again, folio 129b. This is the introduction to Mark's Gospel, the Gospel of Mark. And again, you have the four symbols. You have the man, you have the calf, you have the man, you have the calf, you have the eagle, and you have the lion. The four of them inside their circles. This introduction is referring back to a book from the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel, where we hear of the four figures in wheels, in fiery wheels. Now, this introduction, this page, this folio, 129b, is of particular interest because we can see that parts of one symbol include parts of another symbol. You can also see that the Book of Kells gives us these four different images at the introduction to each of the distinct Gospels to remind us that it is one story that has been told by four different authors. One story, the story of Christ, the Saviour of the world, being told in slightly different way by the four different authors of the four Gospels, by Matthew, by Mark, by Luke, and by John. So finally, a word on the text and context of the Book of Kells. We have today 680 surviving pages, 340 folios. We know from the mere existence of a text of this standard that there was a very high culture on these islands at this time, a very high monastic culture. They were well-educated. They had literacy in Latin and also knew some Hebrew. We learned about this high culture, not only from the manuscripts, but also from the high crosses. And while we don't have that many extant manuscripts on the island of Ireland, we find many of the manuscripts of the Columban family on the continent. They also give us indications of the ecclesial structure, that we very much had a, a church here, which was monastic. They also give us a great theological insight. And it's this latter which is of the greatest concern to us because it is, while a great deal of work has been done, and it's very well established that the Book of Kells is of the greatest importance in the history of the art of this period, in the history of manuscripts, it is our argument that the theological significance of the Book of Kells is of no less importance. We come now to the second part of the presentation, where I'm going to try and give an introduction to the iconography uh, in the book. I think of the iconography the way you think of the letters of an alphabet. If you learn the letters of an alphabet, <coughs> you learn how to read a word and thus how to read a page. Similarly, if you become familiar with the elements of the iconography of the Book of Kells, learn how to read and understand uh, the great illustrated pages, 30 of them, 
and also the very many other um, uses of iconography uh, throughout the book. In general, there are three groups of iconography um, to be found in the Book of Kells. The first, and in some ways the most popularly known, is a group that could be called zoomorphic iconography. That is to say, different animals are used, as it were, carrying a narrative with them. Uh, and when you learn what the animal, as it were, symbolizes or is narrating, then you begin to be able to read the page. So there are lions, there are snakes, there are peacocks, there are doves, there are fish, and many, many more as well. And hopefully we'll give an introduction at least to some of these. The second group of iconographic elements are what, what are liturgical uh, elements or uh, artifacts that are used within the liturgy. For instance, vines, grapes, chalices, bread, and fabula. And once again, we'll come to give a little explanation of that. The third group uh, is of great importance. It's a group of abstract shapes, geometric shapes, um, probably not familiar to uh, a modern audience easily, but of great importance within the Book of Kells and its meaning. So these three elements of, of the iconography and a little bit of introduction to them. The first one I want to speak about is the lion figure. The lion is everywhere on the Book of Kells. Uh, leaping and interacting with other animals. Often the mouth is open significantly, the tongue is protruding, and sometimes the breath of the animal is uh, pouring forth with, with great uh, illuminations. You can see in the slide there, uh, the, the tongue of the lion uh, pouring out. And just notice how sort of joyous it is. There's, there's something that one has to grasp from that a way of seeing a lion. Where did all this come from? Well, first of all, to say, um, probably the scribes in the Book of Kells never saw a lion. It wasn't part of their uh, familiar word. But they knew stories about lions. And two texts are of particular importance in conveying to the scribes of the Book of Kells these stories about lions. And thus to us when we read uh, the uh, uh, iconography. The first of these texts is the Physiologus. This was a Christian text. It was a didactic text. It was telling the Christian story, promoting Christian values and associating that with animals and in, in this particular case uh, in, uh, with lions. So the Physiologus was written in Greek in Alexandria, probably between the second and fourth century, and translated into Latin in the late fourth, fifth century. Uh, and many different ver versions of the Latin translations were widely known. So coming very quickly to the story of the lion in uh, the Physiologus. The Physiologus says, this is the story, the Physiologus says that when a lion cub is born, it's not just the sleep, but it's blind and dead in the Latin mortuum et cacum. Then after three days, the, the male lion returns. You can see him in that depiction there. He breathes on the cub in catalum spirat. The cub comes back to life and receives the light of his eyes. So, in that story about the lion, there is an obvious didactic reference to the resurrection. Uh, it further develops the reference by saying the Gentiles who did not believe were blind and dead until the lion comes as that is the living word, breeding the Holy Spirit on them, uh, recalling them to life and leading them away from perdition. So the lion in Kells is carrying all that story from the physiologus uh, and, and that's the deep uh, provenance of the iconography of Kells, and it's of immense importance in reading the actual pages themselves. One last thing then, um, the second text 
that uh, carries uh, the story of the lines to the scribes of Kells is um, a seventh century work, the etymologies by Isidore of Seville, it's almost like a kind of encyclopedia of its day and age. Isidore of Seville had read everything and he obviously had some kind of contact with the phys physiologus. But the significant point I want to point out is that we know that this text, Isidore's text, was widely known in an Irish context and from an early date. So there's a fragment of, I, I think it's actually the earliest fragment of Isidore's text is in a mid seventh century manuscript in the library of the Irish founded monastery of St. Gallen. So the point here is that these monks and these scribes uh, had sources for the um, iconography of the line. Let's look at another uh, zoomorphic um, element in the Book of Kells, the peacock, a briefer introduction there. Uh, the peacock was considered to, the flesh of the peacock was considered to be incorruptible, and therefore the peacock became a symbol of uh, the resurrection of Christ and the eternal life of Christ. And there's a story actually by St. Augustine that he tried out this theory that the peacock's flesh was incorruptible and kept it after, uh, after the, the bird was dead and it remained uh, uh, incorruptible. Augustine tells us that, but that's the story of the peacock. So the peacock too is telling us resurrection. Actually, it's amazing in Kells how they want to tell people of a transformation of life that is a transformation into eternal life. There's a second feature of the peacock that gets mentioned in these tales. The peacock loses its glorious feathers in the autumn and regrows them in the spring. And this augments its um, value as a symbol of resurrection. Briefly now, another, uh, another uh, one of the zoomorphic um, iconographic elements. These are the very vocabulary of the illustrated manuscripts. This is the snake. Uh, beautifully drawn. I mean, I'm giving you just one image. There, there are hundreds of uh, images of snakes and hundreds of images of lions and many, many images of peacocks, all in wondrous variety. But what was the snake's uh, iconographic uh, uh, significance? Curiously, the snake too was a symbol of Christ's resurrection due to the fact that it renewed its youth when it shed its skin. That was a story that the physiologist picked up on and then Isidore of Seville has, and then it passes to the scribes and they make uh, lavish use of it. At the same time, it's uh, significant, the snake never quite uh, loses its ability to remind us of the fall of humankind uh, as in the story of Genesis. So it can be a multivalent symbolism. Now we come to one of the abstract symbols and the, one of which is of very, very great importance. I think as I was saying earlier, probably not one that would be familiar uh, to, to, to modern uh, sensibilities. This is a figure known to geographers as the rhombus. Art historians call it the lozenge and the layperson, I suppose, would call it a diamond shape. It's a four-sided parallelogram, that all sides having equal length. The opposite sides are parallel and the opposite angles are equal. The importance of this geometric shape was that it seemed a most perfect representation of the number four. This figure becomes laden with symbolic significance from classical times in a tradition that goes back to the Pythagorean philosophies, which were developed from the 6th century BC. These Pythagorean philosophies worked out a numerological worldview. So numerology was regarded as the key to the order and beauty of the universe. And the number four was the perfect number. The number four, in the system played a special role as a cosmic symbol. 
it spoke of the harmony of the cosmos. Space, time, and matter are seen as a fourfold ordering within the cosmos. The four winds, the four cardinal directions, the four seasons of the year, the elements of earth, air, fire, and water, their properties of heat, cold, dryness, and moisture. And in the human realm, which is a cosmic microcosm, there are the four cardinal virtues and the four humors of the body. That was a classical uh, significance attached to this uh, figure, uh, the diamond shaped the rhombus. Christian commentary built on these foundations. Adam's name is a tetragrammaton, formed from just four letters, as Adam himself was formed from four elements. When Adam was expelled from paradise, he was dismissed to the four corners of the universe in exile and alienation. Christ, then, in Christian commentary, is the second Adam. He has come to bring humanity from exile and alienation, from the four corners of the universe. Humanity and then the entire cosmos will be drawn back to order and beauty by the second Adam who is in Christ. So in these perspectives from early Christian times, the quatrain figure that is called lozenge by art historians represented Christ, the Logos. It's a Christogram. It's telling you of Christ as the place where the universe is restored to its cosmic harmony. In the magnificent high cross in Moon Abbey, uh, if you look at the point of the cross where we would traditionally expect to see a figure of Christ, you don't see any figure at all. You just see this abstract diamond shape. Eloquent testimony to the one who died here having cosmic significance in his death. And just a small and kind of footnote point here, the same rhombus shape plays a significant role in the art of Islam, not perhaps with exactly the same meaning, but nonetheless somewhat analogous. The art of Islam is aniconic. In other words, there is no depiction of human figures, but the great um, diamond figure is there with connotations of transcendent and infinite and awesome divinity. Now, one last um, element of the um, iconography. This is a liturgical element. Um, uh, its name is a flabellum. It's a liturgical instrument. It, it's a fan, really, but it's a fan that has become decorative and has a liturgical function. Uh, it seems that its original function was to keep flies away from Eucharistic bread and wine. But then gradually it came to have a processional role. It was brought in procession at the beginning of the Eucharist and waved before the icon of Stasis during the Eucharist in the divine liturgy of the Eastern Orthodox Church, particularly in the Coptic, Byzantine and Armenian churches. Worth mentioning that there because clearly the early Irish church had connections uh, uh, which are much studied and argued over with those um, uh, Coptic, Byzantine, and Armenian churches. Now, those are some of the elements of the iconography. As I was saying earlier, it's like learning an alphabet. When you learn an alphabet, you then get to read a page. And what we're now going to go on to do in this presentation is look at two of the fully illustrated pages and try and show you how the iconography is at work there. I sometimes think that there are three elements in studying any of the pages of Kells. First of all, you have to learn the iconography. That's the bit we have been doing. Then you have to see how the iconography is at work in the page. And then you have, as it were, to stand back and take it all in so that uh, the, the, the full meaning of the page uh, is allowed to work on you. We come now in the first of the two pages that we're going to introduce to folio 7b, 
which is often referred to as a mother and child page. First of all, to say about this image, um, it's the, the earliest surviving Madonna and child illustration in a Western manuscript. It's carved in the late seventh century coffin of St. Cuthbert in Durham, and you find this parallel in some Coptic manuscripts. And in general, it belongs to a tradition of um, icon painting, which is termed the uh, Hoda Getria, meaning the one who shows the way. Let's take a look at it in a little detail, and in particular, trying to point out to you how the elements of iconography are at work. First of all, notice Mary is a strong figure, seated upright on a throne. She's not alone, of course. Mary is never uh, shown alone. She is the one who shows the way. She shows Christ here, depicted not as a baby infant, but a small adult. Now to notice uh, a few of the details a little more carefully. Mary is seated on a high-backed throne. But the throne, of course, is speaking a language of its own. The basis of the throne is decorated with cruciform patterns, multiple cross shapes. So here is a story that includes uh, crucifixion. If we follow the high backrest of the throne upwards, what do we find? We find that it terminates in a red colored lion's head, mouth open, from which coils of breath stream forth in exuberant fashion. In other words, on the throne, there's a movement sweeping upwards from cross to resurrection and breathing forth the, the breath of the Holy Spirit as in John 20, where Jesus says, peace be with you, and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, just saying that, it's worth noting that devotion to Mary was well-founded in the Columban context, and there are hymns uh, from the late 8th century that speak of Mary as most high, the Holy Venerable Virgin. A few other, uh, a few other critical features of um, how the iconography is speaking here in this uh, picture. Look for a moment at the two hands of the figure of the small adult Christ. First look at one hand, which is very delicately uh, touching the hand of Mary in a gesture that has a, a tenderness, um, is replete with a tenderness. Look at the other hand of Christ. Pointing, pointing across to the brooch of Mary. And the brooch of Mary is, of course, the diamond figure that we were just speaking of. And if you look even more closely at that, you will see that within the diamond figure, there are four more diamond figures. So the, the, the brooch is telling us of the cosmic uh, reunification that uh, this scene uh, uh, is going to uh, depict for us. Again, worth noting a, a little is that um, the triple dots on Mary's cloak probably allude to the Trinity. So we're, we're getting into a, a really in-depth story of what the incarnation means uh, for the cosmos and where it comes from, uh, from, from the Trinitarian life. Some scholars think that the white uh, color of these triple dots might represent milk from Mary's breasts, which are uh, depicted quite prominently, uh, unusually prominently uh, uh, in, in this story. Um, Back again to the main, main picture. The um, figure of Mary 
showing forth her son, the cosmic Christ, uh, the one uh, who brings us and the cosmos from death to new life, is surrounded by four angels. Uh, the angels are messengers of God. They live in the presence of God. And here they are present in this scene. We notice uh, three of those angels are holding the fabula symbol. In other words, they're reminding us that um, the liturgy of the Eucharist um, uh, is, is uh, present, as it were, uh, in this story, embedded in the story. Eucharistic communion presupposes incarnation. So uh, Eucharistic uh, communion is, is an exercise of the, um, uh, of the incarnation. The fourth angel is holding another liturgical um, instrument, which uh, is a kind of a torable. So we are in the presence, we're in the Eucharist, we're in Eucharistic communion, we're in the um, moment of incarnation, and we're aware of its cosmic significance. As I was saying a little earlier, I do think when you've done all, oh yes, around the borders, of course, it's very, probably haven't time to show in any detail. There are intricate snake figures, really joyous snake figures, one after the other. And they're re and they're re emphasizing, emphasizing the sense of new life and of resurrection. But I do think the third movement uh, in studying the Book of Kells is actually one when you try to leave the whole of it, as it were, um, make its way into your mind. Okay, so now we're going to continue on with the Eucharistic symbolism, if you like, and go to another folio, this time folio 34 or so just one moment. So there we have folio 34 or. So just take a moment to look at that folio. Existing in a nebulous limbo between ornament and illustration, the eccentric agglomeration of animals, fish and insects offers a potential abundance of symbolic meanings, expanding in consort with the dense clouds of decoration proliferating from the letter itself. Whatever significance they may have, however, seems as evasive as the twists and turns of the accompanying interlaces and trumpet spirals. The Cairo page contains a wealth of metaphorical images whose meanings elude us in a redundant thicket of nuanced illusions. For this reason, its imagery has often been regarded as playful ornament without content. But the decorated incipit forms a sacred riddle which invites a closer scrutiny. An investigation of some of its patristic and early medieval textual sources, as well as an analysis of the relationship of the Cairo design to the other full page illuminations in the Kells Codex, suggest that this majestic page may have been intended to confront the initiated eye with an awesome array of Christological and Eucharistic allusions consonant with the liturgical usage of the book. So this is not a sacred riddle. This is a work full of meaning. And these were the words of Suzanne Lewis in an article entitled Sacred Calligraphy, the Cairo page in the Book of Kells. So the page we're looking at now is folio 34R. And it contrasts sharply with the earlier picture of the mother and child, because this one seems much more complex to interpret. What's going on? Is it simple, simply decoration? This page is actually a depiction of Matthew 1.18, which speaks of the birth of Christ. We've just been through the genealogy of Christ, and we have, if you like, in Kells, a second, what they call in Chippet, a second beginning of this gospel. And the second beginning of this gospel begins Cairo Autum Generatio. This is the story of the generation of Christ. This page is about the naming of Christ, 
and it's a celebration of the incarnation and of the Eucharist, just as the other folio was that we looked at. So folio 34R is not a sacred riddle, but it is full of meaning. And we will now go and explore some of that meaning. I think the first thing to look at is the Chi Rho. This again is, as you've heard mentioned earlier, a Christogram, a symbol of Christ. Christos is the Greek word for Christ, and it goes with a Chi Rho Iota. It's spelled with Chi Rho Iota, and we can see these here. If you look carefully, I think you can see the arrow tracing it, you've got a Chi, which is like a, an X. Now it's a decorative X, but it's Chi. That's chi. And then you have the rho, which is like an or going around like that. And then you have the iota. Chi, rho, iota. Christos. And if you move down to the bottom of the page, you will see that we have more letters that are easier to read in one sense. You've got a H and then generatio. The H stands for autumn. It was used regularly in manuscripts as shorthand for autumn. And then generatio. So we have this is how Christ was generated. This is how Christ was begotten. This is how Christ became. And this message is greeted with great joy. Christo altum generatio. It's interesting that you can see, if we follow the row again, the row ends in a face. This is a more adult version of the child that we've seen with Mary. This again is, we surmise, the face of Christ. And in the Book of Kells, Christ is redheaded, a redheaded Irishman. We are speaking of Christ. We are celebrating Christ. We are celebrating what they call the Nomen Sacra, the sacred name of Christ. And so this page is full of images of Christ. And like in the other page, we also have the cross because Christ was born for the cross, for death on a cross, into eternal salvation, into eternal life. If we look here again, we will see we have a cross here in the row. And here we have another cross, a saltire cross. So the message that the monks were seeking to communicate was that Christ is born for our salvation. Christ is born for resurrection into eternal life. Chi Rho Iota. This page, folio 34R, is known as the Chi Rho page. The Chi Rho page. So we've seen the Chi Rho Altum Generatio. We've seen the crosses, the symbol of death, but it's a death into eternal life. There's also a symbol that Khan has just given a lot of attention to. We have here our lozenge and our lozenge. This is a cosmic symbol. When we see the lozenge, we again think of Christ. So we've Cairo, Iota, Christus. We have the face of Christ. And now we have the lozenge, reminding us of the cosmic significance of the incarnation, the becoming flesh of the second person of the Trinity into the world. The lozenge, as we've heard, is a symbol of the harmony of the cosmos. And on this page, I've said there's also Eucharistic symbolism, very strong Eucharistic symbolism. And that's very much about the harmony of the cosmos. We have three sets of animals. We're going to have animals of the earth, animals of the sea, and animals of the air. So let us start with the animals of the earth. If you go to the very bottom, you will see here cute little either rats and mice or cats and rats. And between them, we have what we call a Eucharistic host. And at this stage, they did celebrate the Eucharist with hosts somewhat like this. Okay, so they were familiar with that. We have the mice playing with the Eucharistic host, nibbling it. And we have harmony between cats and rats, or cats and or rats and mice, whichever you want. So at the advent of Christ, with the celebration of the Eucharist, we are celebrating harmony in the cosmos. When we come together to celebrate the Eucharist, we are to come together to grow in peace with one another. So now we go from the animals of the earth to those of the air. Remember our lozenge is reminding us of the harmony of all of creation. So here we have two moths 
and they, between them is what we call a chrysalis. It's the chrysalis from which the moth emerged. They are eating their chrysalis, like the mice were nibbling on the Eucharistic host. These moths are eating the chrysalis, which gave them life and which gave them from which they were born. So again, a symbol of birth, if you like, from death, of rebirth. So we've had the animals of the earth and we have the animals of the air. And now to the animals of the water. And this is down very near the animals. Okay. You can see here an otter with a fish in its mouth. Now this again is a very rich symbolism from the Book of Kells. The fish symbol is a very rich Christian symbol from the early days. We go back to Greek, the fish symbol, fish, the Greek word for fish is ichthus, or we would say as I-C-H-T-H-U-S. And it's an acrostic for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior of the word. That's how the early Christians began to express this word ichthus. They saw the fish as a symbol of Christ, another Christogram. And we know this again from readings of the Fathers of the Church, someone like Tertullian, an early father of the church, in an article De, De Baptismo, he wrote, we little fishes, after the image of our Ictus Christ, are born in the water of baptism. So Christ, again, is a symbol, or sorry, the fish is a symbol of Christ. And we find fish, either a pike or a salmon, we're not sure, all over the Book of Kells, often used just over an eye or in different parts of the letter in the writing of the texts. Moving, focusing specifically on the Irish context, we have an eighth century Irish tract on John 21, which assures us that the fish and the bread have but one meaning. They signify the body of Christ, his death on the cross and the resurrection. And so the Kells fish is a symbol of Corpus Christi, of the body of Christ, of the Eucharist. And the monks were very familiar with this. And now to our little otter, who is holding the fish in his mouth. In the life of Comgan, we read that an otter, or a water dog, brought a salmon every day to provide company of monks with food. Similarly, in the Vita Sanctorum Hibernia, we read that the hermit Paul was brought to the spot for his resurrection, a rocky island, where his servant, an otter, a sea dog, brought him a fish every day for 30 years. So the image of the otter with the fish is the image of the body of Christ being provided for our nourishment. The food offered to people in the church is the incarnate Christ himself. So I think just a final look at the page, which is very much a celebration of incarnation of Eucharist. Kai ro <clears throat> Christus autem generatio. Christ was born to die on the cross, to share with us eternal life through the Eucharist, and to bring peace on all earth through the cosmos. So now that we have read two of the decorated pages, we hope that we have demonstrated the profound theological significance of the Book of Kells, the great gospel of Colum Kill, the greatest treasure of the Western Isles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Fauncia and Khan, for that very rich and uh, um, beautifully illustrated uh, uh, presentation. And it's it's wonderful to have the, the theological insights in into the Book of Kells, as as you rightly say that it's it's an it's an aspect that's often um, not as uh, not as uh, brought out as as it could be. Um, just to um, <clears throat> If anyone has any questions, please, please put them in the, the Q&A. Um, just to kick things off, um, obviously, your, your mention of the redheaded Christ um, made me think of um, Giotto also has quite a number of redheaded Christ 
yeah, and and I remember remarking upon that in, in Italy and it seemed quite odd because you, you do have this um, association with Christ and, and red hair, but then you also have later depictions of, of Judas and the devil, you know, as well. <laughs> so can you, can you comment on, on that or, or in terms of the, the, the symbolism? Not sure very much to comment on it, but I mean, looking at yourself, Alex, one is wondering. You certainly have to be on the good side of the redheaded <laughs> folks. I, th I, I think I think that was a somewhat trivial uh, remark that we were making there. Because, but you see, a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, art that is particularly actually in that uh, Cairo page. Um, has elements of the Celtic origins of um, the kind of art that is in the Book of Kells. And of course, a lot of the Celts were, were redheaded too. So it probably has a contemporary uh, depiction to it, but how profound you'd want to uh, be able to push that, that illusion, I'm not so sure. Yeah, no, thank you. I have a question here from uh, Bernice. Uh, the Book of Kells postdates Colum Kill. So, how did it come to be identified as his great gospel book? Again, that's like we were trying to say at the beginning. It's from the family of monasteries which Colum Kill, Columba gave birth to, and it's within that school of that tradition that it was produced. And again, the connection always back to, as we mentioned, that relics books became associated with these holy people, and they became very much respected and revered in that tradition. And that's probably why it survived as well, because it was so closely associated with them. But it came from that family of monasteries. And is, isn't there, is, is there some kind of line of argument that it was kind of commissioned for the second centenary? That's, yeah, that there's a line of argument that it's commissioned for the second century centenary, but it wasn't finished in time. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That, that's a good point, I suppose, with thinking about Adavnon of Iona, he was writing for the first centenary of Columbus death and that is an argument that the book of Kells was commemorate the second second centenary there's another little difficulty with that which seemed a very plausible thing that was the second centenary commemoration they're not sure that centenaries were celebrated in the way that we would so as with a lot of the scholarship around the book of Kells you get fairly close to certainty but then someone will always find a reason to unsettle you a little bit yeah yeah, no, thank you. There's a question from Colm Holmes. Um, in the mother and child image, what is the significance of the six men exiting the screen on the lower right? Oh, yeah, that's a very good question indeed. I just didn't have time to get them. There are six men uh, looking to the right uh, in the image, and um, they clearly have a significance. They, they're doing something that the rest of uh, the icon, if you like, is not doing. I think the best, best explanation of them is that they are a turn the page uh, device. In other words, they're telling you, if you want to find uh, the significance um, of this whole icon, go to the next page. And there you will find that it begins with the word nativitas, and it's the beginning of the short edition of Matthew's gospel, and it's saying, read on. There is another view that there may be um, a, a depiction of Columban monks, but I think much the more plausible for me is that they're a turn the page now and read on. When you have contemplated this icon, turn the page and read on to the story of, of Christ's birth. No, no, thank you. Um, there's another question here um, about the Madonna and Child image, and is it derived from the Isis and Osiris image, which is pre-Christian, this, this kind of idea. Could you comment on that? That again, Alex. So the, the, the idea that the Madonna and Child picture is derived from the Isis and, and Osiris, so in, in, in ancient e Egyptian uh, iconography. Um, and if you could say something around that. I think, I mean, the art historians definitely will say that the um, mother and child image that we have there, which is the earliest in the Western um, world, 
is from the Eastern Church, and that would mean the Coptic Church. And tracing further the, uh, the art historians would say, well, yes, there's uh, some link between uh, the, the ISIS um, kind of figures, uh, perhaps taken over into a Christian context. Um, for me personally, that's interesting, but I think you need a, as well to see what you're actually being presented there in uh, Folio 7b. I, I have little doubt that it's genuine to say that you can trace back the artistic origins uh, via Coptic origins, mm. but um, yeah. uh, that's, that's an important dimension, but it's not perhaps the fullest reading. And uh, am, I right, am I right in saying that the depiction of Our Lady is the earliest depiction in Western art? It yeah. is. It is. It yeah. is. So quite, quite, remarkable. quite incredible. Yeah, yeah. And um, it is like, I, I know the, the fact that the, um, the infant Christ has been shown as, 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 as a kind of, as a kind of um, an, an, ad, an adult. Um, what's the significance of that again? Uh, well, I think, first of all, it is a kind of a shock to our, our way of reading a Madonna and Child thing. Um, I'm not sure that uh, it could be that that's just the way they wanted to depict uh, a Madonna and Child connection, uh, and that they didn't necessarily either want to or have the precedence of presenting a baby mother and child. Um, I think it might be just that that's the way they wanted to present the mother and child relationship, not as an infant one, but as a rather grown up one. But that's a great shock to our modern sensibilities because we're always sort of saturated with images of mother and baby. And I suppose what you've really emphasized the important the importance of the Eucharistic imagery that that litters the, the the book of Kells, yeah. yeah, and how it's such a rich source for for the Eucharist in 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 early Christian Ireland. Um, just seeing if there's any other questions. Um, So this is um, from Bernice. Are there any images in the Book of Kells that we might interpret as a reference to Luke 14, 26? If you come to me but will not leave your family, you cannot be my follower. You must love me more than your father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, even more than your own life. Hey. Don't, I, I couldn't answer that without looking at the actual text. You'd have to find the text in the script and see what was there, but it wouldn't stand out to me as something. There isn't a full page, illustrated page. However, the other pages do have decorations on them. Hmm. Um, I don't know of anything specifically significant yeah. on that one, Bernice. And just, just a final question from Nicole. Um, above the mother and child, the two angels are pointing seemingly towards the half circle in the middle at the top. Does this represent the Holy Spirit or God himself, as it's been suggested for the Stonyhurst Gospel, or would you have another interpretation? I'm inclined to think that, that it's probably best to think of it as representing um, the transcendent presence of God. Um, but again, I say like that, um, particularly actually in that modern child thing, it's very important to, to grasp the iconography and then to read the whole picture together. Um, well, of course, the Cairo page is, is just a wonderful example of the same thing. Mm -hmm. We have a particular way of thinking of mother and child, of Mary and Jesus. Uh, this is in a much different, it is communicating a much bigger in-depth narrative that goes from uh, incarnation to Eucharist and to cosmic significance. And it, it takes a bit of, I suppose, learning and getting used to it. Um, but like, that's really what the Book of Kells illustrates are trying to do. They're trying to present the whole learning to you uh, and not just um, uh, a 
familiar uh, uh, episode in isolation. Probably why they're so valuable to us is that they're actually very different from some of our more familiar um, icons of modern. And can can you just mention briefly about the um, the Future Learn um, online course and also the the MPhil module in um, in Trinity? The Future Learn. I'm not sure. Do you send out the powerpoints as well when you send out the recordings to people? But I have a link for the Future Learn on the powerpoints. Um, or if you just Google Future Learn Book of Kells and you get free access to a four week course um, on the Book of Kells, which gives you the art history and the theology. Um, and the, also, if you're interested in this, we offer a module on our MPhil and Christian theology, which is on the theology of the early Irish church, in which we look, in which Alex is also teaching and Con teaches and I teach, and we look in more detail at the Book of Kells, we look at the High Crosses, we look at Columba, we look at Adam, and we look at various things on this very interesting period on which not enough theology, theological study has been done. And there is a, details of all that on the Loyola Institute website. There's lots of other modules if people are interested in theology, certificates, diplomas, whatever. Thank you. And I'm, I'm correct in thinking that, that you're both planning to do further work in terms of the theology of the Book of Kells. Yeah. It is in the plan when the time comes, we would like to actually put together some type of um, a book, sort of an introduction to the theological readings of the Book of Kells yeah. in time. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Fonch, and, and thank you, Khan, again, for just a, a very stimulating and, and rich presentation. Um, just to, to mention, um, our next uh, speaker next week, next Wednesday, is Dr. Billy Swan, uh, also a, a theologian, and he will be speaking on St. Columba and the existential categories of displacement and identity. So it's really around identity should be should be a fascinating uh, talk it's um 6th of october at at the same time so thank you again for joining us this evening and uh, slow on august banat